Production funding is brought to you in part by A. Reddix & Associates, a healthcare management consulting firm bridging the gap between healthcare policy and the community through education, training, and outreach. Find out more at ARDX.net. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. The superstars of Jazz Fusion will be heading to downtown Norfolk next week to participate in the region's longest-running outdoor jazz festival. Performing at the concert is jazz pianist Lonnie Liston-Smith, and we are honored to have him in the studio with us, along with another great jazz musician, our very own Jay Sennett. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Yes. Thanks for joining. So you're coming to Norfolk? Oh, yes. Next week to perform? Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's going to be fun. This will be your what number concert? Do you have any idea? Uh, I don't have an idea. You know, but plus we, but we've always done this festival at least, you know, I think last time I was here, I had my own group. And mm -hmm. then this time we, I'm going to be here with the All-Stars. And so you'll be here with Roy Ayers and... Right. Roy something. Ayers, um, Ronnie Laws, Tom Brown, and Wayne Henderson from mm -hmm. the Jazz Crusaders. Now, you call this, J, they call it Jazz Fusion. Right. And let's explain to our audience, both of you, your, your definition of Jazz Fusion and where this form of jazz came into being. Well... I'll start with you, Lonnie. Okay, what happened was, I remember, you know, I used to work with Miles Davis and... and uh, Max Roach, Art Blakely, and mm -hmm. Jay, we were discussing earlier, uh, you know, Rossan, Roland Kirk. And um, so I decided, I, and, but I also loved the funk, you know, James Brown and all that, and because and, I grew up listening to, to you know, music, everyone. And so I, back in the 70s, I did a record called Expansions. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me, let me put, keep the improvisation from jazz and add the funk on the bottom and and, and then I did expansions, and, and it worked. And I mean, expansions just conquered the whole world. And when I went to London, they said, well, Lonnie, you're the godfather of jazz fusion funk. And so that's, I guess that's how it, how it all kind of started. And how it all came together. Right. Jay, jazz fusion, do you play jazz fusion too? Do you participate? Yeah, I mean, there, a lot of the writers from a historical standpoint will say the fusion was a combination S simplifying it. it was a combination of rock and jazz you know more funk rock jazz because at its inception there was electric guitar you know you mm, had the electric yeah. electric vibe happening and rhythmically fusion was set up off of a straight eighth note jazz is set up off of a swinging eighth note so but they the the, the fusion players kept the like Lonnie said the improvisational part of jazz mm -hmm. um, but put more of a groove you know mm -hmm. under underneath it and Miles was at the helm of that whole movement. Uh, then, then came Weather Report. Then came Trickeria and Return to Forever. And and uh, is that some where of those it bands. became more? Is that kind of the beginning of this? Of what they now call smooth jazz? Is that is that uh, the same that, thing? That's 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 another uh, genre altogether. Okay. smooth jazz. Okay. We were doing. What they, what they call smooth jazz, we were doing that. When we weren't playing the fusion funk, we were playing the, like, sort of quiet. Mm -hmm. So we were doing that way back in the 70s. Cause see, that's when I remember you from, right. from my college days. See, <laughs> that's but, but it. I think, I think there's a fundamental difference, though, in smooth today versus when you guys were playing, oh. because you had real players playing real instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't as much. Smooth today is more keyboard more dominating. Keyboard. Mm -hmm. No. You know, not we, back then, not when they were doing it. Oh, no, no, we, we were playing. That's, see, that's what I'm saying. I mean. They have gotten too smooth now, because you, you still you 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 smooth, but you still got to have that edge, mm -hmm. and and you still got to be playing. Mm -hmm. But they, they have just you know they've just smoothed it all out. Hip hop artists today are sampling some of your music, aren't they? Look here, that is Barbara. That's amazing. I mean. I mean, I mean, I tell these young kids. I say, you know, I work with Miles Davis, and I did expansions. And so I was in the, I was in the barber shop and I heard this little kid playing on his iPod. He was playing my song. I said, "Man, you playing my song?" And he said, "He said, man, no, you didn't write this song." I said, "Man, that's my song, A Garden of Peace." I mean, he went crazy. I mean, he thought I was a god or something. <laughs> but that's how they discover you because he heard it. Jay Z sampled it on uh, Dead Presidents. Mm -hmm. Mary J. Blige sampled it, A Garden of Peace, when she did uh, her hit single, "Take Me As I Am." And so now the kids are, are buying the song, A Garden of Peace, because they heard it in the background. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so 
I don't know. I mean, it's just it's a blessing. Well, you played it for us, didn't you? Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> so let's a... take a listen okay. and hear A Garden of Peace. Absolutely beautiful. Hey, thank Absolutely you. beautiful. Thank you. What were you thinking about when you composed that song? Well, I really was thinking about, uh, you know, because I always was thinking, I'll write songs like Expand Your Mind, Visions of a New World, uh, Give Peace a Chance. And when I wrote that, I was thinking about, you know, with all this confusion and chaos going on in the world, and, and right now, the same things going on today, you know, we all need a garden of peace to go into. And just, that's what it was. You all know. of your music has some sort of spiritual message or positive message to it mm -hmm. that's important to you that, that that's important barbara i mean because uh out of all the arts I mean, mu mu music is really special mm -hmm. i mean and music can can I've, I've been over in europe or other countries and everyone spoke a different language but when they listen to the music they all got it Mm -hmm. in their language. I mean, that's, that's something to think about. So that is the universal language that is, uh, it. That is there. Jay, when you're composing, because you, you're also a composer, what, what kind of goes through your mind? Do you, do you say, today I'm going to write a song <laughs> about X, or, or does it really just kind of come to you as, as a rhythm and you just kind of work through it? I have different concepts, Barbara, for each, each project I do. Mm -hmm. um, for example, It's Telling, my It's Telling record, A Drummer's Perspective. I wanted to, to really make a record about the drums. I just wanted to really make a record that I could just really zero in on the drums. So I was writing from the, what I would identify as the bottom up, from rhythm to melody, as opposed mm -hmm. from melody down to yeah. rhythm. Okay. Um, Senate Hearings, that record was melody down to rhythm. I wasn't as much focused on drumming as I was the ensemble. 
Um, and I, it, it's it, you write from your experiences. When I was I was going through uh, some personal things when uh, I was writing for the Senate hearings. Um, so I, I think Lonnie would agree. You, you write from life experiences and how mm -hmm. things affect you and how things shape you. Mm -hmm. If you get sick and you feel bad for a week, you know that's going to that's going to affect you in yeah. some kind of way. Yeah. Do you have a start a piece? And I ask this to both of you. Start a piece in a certain mood at a certain time, and maybe something distracts you from it, and you may not pick it up again until you know a later time. Does it change the focus? Um, well, that's, that's a good point, because now uh, I heard one of my songs, Shadows. Uh, someone played it, and I haven't heard Shadows in I don't know how many years, mm -hmm. and I haven't played it. But now I, I picked it back up, and I got home, I said, wow, that sounds, that sounds good. So I started playing it again, and now I've added another section to, the, to put something in the middle. So that, that's a good point. That, so that, so it, does, it could change it depending on whether you go straight through or whether you right. come back to it. Or whether you come back to it or else then, because when you, it's like a growing process also, because you grow, so. Mm -hmm. the, the, so the music grows. That's it. Do you look back at some of your original songs, Jay, or your early playings versus where you are today? Do you ever go, wow? Well, of course, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I've written over 200 songs, but I probably really like 11 of them. But, I, but I, think, I think what happens though, what I try to do, my philosophy is that I try to eliminate the questions. In other words, if I write a piece of music, I don't want to go back and say, well, man, I should have done this, or could I have done that, or could I have done this? So I try, and I, I think that's the sign of a, of, a, of, a, of a composer developing, maturing. Mm -hmm. When you can eliminate the, the questions that you would have after it's done. And the more I recorded over the years, the more I've written over the years, I've had fewer questions about my music. So I feel in that, in that place, I'm getting to my compositional point mm -hmm. more easily. But there are a few things now, like Lonnie said, when I go back, even the songs that I'm, I'm very, very comfortable with, um, I wouldn't necessarily add additional changes like for a recording, mm -hmm. but live, oh. You know, when you're doing something it, live, you can add to it to, to put another edge on a different direction. We've got one of your songs, theme from Joe Ben. You want to set it up a little bit for us? Well, one of my big, uh, one of my favorite composers, uh, Brazilian composer, Antonio Carlos Jobim. Jobim. Um, uh, I've always been a big fan of his music. Lonnie, I'm sure, is familiar with oh, Jobim. Uh, very romantic, but I thought I would write something as a tribute to Jobim, but put a little funk on it. Okay. You know, Americanize it a little bit, you know, put a little groove on it. <laughs> Let's take a listen. <laughs> Heard the funk. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You know, it, I have to tell you, it was really interesting. When I first became familiar with you, I was surprised that you were a percussionist. Only because I think that uh, when someone is the leader of the group, they automatically assume they're the oh, keyboardist. You'd be or surprised. The... You'd be surprised, Barbara. I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody has seen my group for the first time, they've never seen pictures of, oh, of the band, yeah. and they go up to the piano player, hey Jay, yep. pleasure, nice <laughs> meeting you, you know? and I'm like, no, you I'm over here. <laughs> and then, you know, one of the most uh, peculiar questions I've ever been asked, and I get to ask this question a lot, how do you write from the drums? Mm. Right. Never assuming that, well, maybe I play something else, mm -hmm. and I compose from the piano. So you compose mm. from the piano. Yeah. What do you, you compose from the piano also, that's, oh, yeah. that's, that's your roots, Everything but you there. also played other instruments. Oh yeah, because I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, my father, you know, was, uh, he was with the harmonizing folk right, gospel, gospel group. Mm -hmm. So I mean, 
I, Barbara, I wanted to do everything music. I mean, I, I can't even explain it. Cause when I think about it now, I said, well, Lonnie, how did you get this far? Because all I ever did was music. Was music. That was a and so I sang bass in the choir, and I played tuba in the marching band and in and, and Armstrong High School wow. and Morgan State University. But back then, I was playing the real tuba that weighed about 100,000 pounds. <laughs> you know? And you had that rhythm of marching with it too, didn't you? And, and, and the wet, uh, uh, soggy fields. And, but I was happy. So, yeah, that, yeah. That, that is fantastic. So what do you think about today's music that is not jazz? And, and where does jazz fit in? Mm, yeah, because it's definitely going through a transition now. And... Um, but I've heard I've heard this little young girl. I heard she was here at the at the theater over there. What is it? At the attic theater. Attic theater. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. and that's I didn't know really that theater was that had that much history behind it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Esperanza, was that her name? Esperanza mm -hmm. Spalding. Yeah. Esperanza mm -hmm. Spalding. Mm -hmm. Now I mean I I love the way she's she's on the right track. So I, I hope she keeps going. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear something like that, that, that gives you inspiration. That does give you inspiration. So you think that today's music is, you know, a lot of older people say, ah, oh, that's not music. That's right. something else, but it's not music. I mean, do you, how do you judge today's standards? Because you guys played real instruments and did everything from a real instrument perspective. A lot of it is synthesized now. Yeah, and, and but, well, a lot of it, you know, you just don't listen to. But then, but you hear, you, uh, hear people like, oh, Jill Scott. Jill Scott is, is doing doing a great job, and and of course Murray J. Blige. I mean, she has a real voice, mm -hmm. and uh, then you got. I haven't heard Charlie's latest record, but I mean, you know, I like all, all of her uh, other things. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm I, I got a feeling that maybe it'll all turn around, and and, and then some some young person will come out of that that you say, okay. I, I think Barbara. I think mm -hmm. the young kids today you know, let's say 20s, early 30s, when they started listening to music, really grasping music, most of the music that they were listening to was electronic based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I say this because I think this is profoundly important. The music I grew up on, the music you grew up on, Lonnie grew up on, was human based. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so. there was, an emo there was a, a depth of emotional quality to the music mm -hmm. that when we heard music, that music we felt it before we intellectualized it. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, today I think a lot of these kids are reacting to a beat. It's not something that they are really feeling. I mean, it's it's a beat, okay, something repetitive, but, mm -hmm. the, but when you listen to the song plus, and this is another good example of what I'm talking about, records today, you release a record today, two, three months down the road, you forget about that record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not back in the day. Yeah. You know, we keep going back to those records. Exactly. And we go back to those records because they reached us in an emotional oh, way man. that connected us in, in such a very special, deep emotional way. And I don't think a lot of that's happening today. Lonnie, that's a good point. jazz seems to appeal to an audience that is not African American. Or, or not as much African American as yeah. it is other races. Why do you think that is? That's an interesting point, Barbara, because African Americans don't don't realize that all the arts, especially in America, came from them. Right. I mean, they they, gave, they just gave away the blues. I mean, you go to a blues concert, you you don't see an African American, mm -hmm. and and I hope they don't just give away jazz. I mean, because. Jazz, it, it, jazz is a universal language. I mean, you go all over the world, they look at jazz as classical music, mm -hmm. except, for, except for when you come home. So, I mean, I hope African Americans wake up and, and just, cause I, I think they say when you're in Africa, they have all this beautiful artwork, mm -hmm. but they use it every day as, a, as, a, as a, uh, maybe to eat out or whatever. Then they just, you know, but, but it's real art. And so I, I hope um, uh, American, especially Afro, uh, Afro-American people- Will realize what they have in terms of, what the, they have. of the music. Jay, what do you think about that? I was touring with Ellis Marsalis once and Ellis said something very interesting to me. He said, with, with the African-American community back in the day, it was the Saturday night throwdown and the Sunday morning church service, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. See, jazz was a dance music. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, and what happened when bebop came along, and I, and I believe this is just a, a personal opinion. Lonnie, may, maybe you'll agree with this or mm -hmm. disagree with me on this, but I, I can't help but believe that Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and Monk, Charles Mingus, I think they saw the white audiences going to the theaters. 
sitting and listening to the orchestras and sitting and listening oh, to the symphonies wow. play. Right. And I think they wanted an environment like that where people can sit and listen to them play. So the music shifted with bebop conceptually and stylistically. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the separation of the black community started because up to that point, the African American community looked at jazz as a dance music. Now it's a listening music. It's becoming a listening music. White audiences were conditioned to sitting and listening to music, but the black community wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the shift started the set the detachment from the African American community to jazz. Wow, what are you yeah. working on now? Uh, right now we just doing touring because okay. I, uh, I, I'm actually I'm gonna get back into because I've been doing a lot of the All Star thing, but now I'm, I'm just gonna get back into Lonnie Listen Smith and the Cosmic Echoes with my own group. So I know we're doing Blues Alley on September the 15th, and then we're doing a tour of uh, Europe in October. So and then, and then I've heard uh, a lot of new young drummers. So I've gotten re-inspired, and because I, you know, I hear the drums from. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say I know the two of uh, you performed at uh, one uh, point uh, too. <laughs> I know. I mean, you, you know, it's, uh, it's our uh, young uh, pianist too. Now, come on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Man. I'm with you. <laughs> but you know, but I'm because I'm a person. I, I hear the drums and the bass first. So okay. you know, that's me. Well, we we are gonna hear a little bit more from you in just a moment. Um, but right. the talking part will. We're going to take a little bit of a break okay. and uh, go check out what's happening in Hampton Roads. And when we come back, a real treat as Lonnie Liston-Smith performs, especially for you, our Another View audience. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. We've enjoyed talking with Lonnie Liston Smith and Jay Sennett. And now it's time to hear some of Lonnie's wonderful tunes. Just to remind you, the 28th annual Norfolk Jazz Festival kicks off next Friday, July 23rd at 5 p.m. at Town Point Park and runs through Saturday evening. And now an Another View exclusive, Mr. Lonnie Liston Smith performing at the Attics Theater just for our audience. Thanks to the Attics for the venue and the piano. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy the soulful sounds of Lonnie Liston and Smith, and I'll see you next week for another view.
Action Funding is brought to you in part by A. Reddix & Associates, a healthcare management consulting firm bridging the gap between healthcare policy and the community through education, training, and outreach. Find out more at ARDX.net.